So, lecture one, two, voltage dividers. Is that a good size for you guys? Bigger, smaller? That's too big. Sorry. Okay. In chapter two, which is not now, we're in chapter one still, we'll learn about how to approach circuit analysis in a systematic way, which is the way I like to do circuit analysis. Um, but for now, we'll limp along unsystematically with our tool belt of concepts and equations in order to introduce some more circuit elements, concepts, and theorems. So that's uh, sort of the plan is we're going to get more systematic later on. And then, you know, chapter two, we get a little bit more systematic. But then in the system dynamics portion that we'll turn to uh, in like week seven, we'll get even more systematic. Okay, so for now, we're just being um, very unsystematic. <clears throat> the voltage divider is a ubiquitous and useful circuit. In a sense, it's less of a circuit and more of a concept. For resistors, that concept can be stated as follows. I don't know. It sounds weird. Uh, the voltage across resistors in series is divided among the resistors. So, I need to change that. The voltage across resistors in series is divided among the resistors. It's a pretty easy idea. You've got voltage applied across several resistors. The voltage is sort of uh, uh, split up among them, okay? An immediately useful result is that we can divide voltage into any smaller voltage we like by putting in a couple of resistors. It's pretty cool. That's, that's a useful thing to be able to do. Say you have a 20 volt source and you need 12 volts, you can put in a voltage divider. It's not, it's not the best solution in many cases, but it's a solution. Um, it wastes power is the main reason why you don't always want to do that. But it's, it's cheap, it's easy, and it's quick. Uh, in order to show how the voltage divider divides up the voltage, we must do some basic circuit analysis. Consider the circuit in figure 1-1. One, one. So this is the figure 1-1. One, one. We've got two resistors, R1 and R2, in series. And we apply an input voltage from the top of R1 to the bottom of R2. So input voltage is denoted V in. And we're going to say we are interested in the output voltage across resistor R2. So that'll be our output voltage. So what we'd like to do is to write down the equations that we know um, uh, and solve for what V out is in terms of V in. Okay, so that's our goal. So we're working towards. Um, and we know several things uh, just from our Kirchhoff's laws and from Ohm's law. We know several equations. We'll write those down. So the first one we already actually wrote down, and that is um, that VR2 is equal to V out. Right? So the voltage across R2 we're, we're going to denote VR2. It's going to, we have to decide which direction we're going to say is a positive voltage drop. We'll talk more about sign convention when we get more systematic, but for now, a positive voltage drop will be denoted plus to minus. And uh, we'll also have a VR1 dropping plus to minus across R1. So, We know that VR2 is equal to V out, right? We, we chose V out to just be the voltage across R2, so that makes sense, right? And 
so we already have that formula written down. Um, we know uh, uh, the parameters R1 and R2, of course. Let's write down the equations we know from Kirchhoff and Ohm. So first of all, let's do Ohm's law. So Ohm's law applies to resistors, right? Or things that behave like resistors. So let's write it for R1 first. It would say that VR1 is equal to what? IR1, R1, yeah. And Ohm's law for R2 is going to look essentially the same, right? Good. Now, so we've got two equations. Uh, we know some other things too. We know KVL and KCL, right? So KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law, applies around loops, and KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, applies at nodes, right? All nodes. And one of the trickiest parts before we get systematic is to decide which nodes and which loops to apply these laws to. It turns out that you can write a lot more equations, you can apply that law a lot more than is useful, because you're going to write essentially the same equation multiple times in a different form. Um, there'll, there'll be equations that won't be independent. So for now, we're just <laughs> flailing along, right? I said limping, so we're limping. I'm literally limping, so it works. Um, we're limping along, just applying it places. So let's do uh, first this, this loop. So here's a loop. Let's start at this node and let's go around the, uh, let's go down this resistor, down this resistor, and then we're going to use this labeled voltage V in to jump back up to the start. Okay? So that's, that's going to be our, our loop in this case. So we're going to say VR1 plus VR2. So we're, we're using the convention that a drop is going to be positive. So VR1, drop, VR2, drop. And then this is going to be in the direction we're going around this loop, Vn is a gain, right? It drops from top to bottom, so it's going to be a gain. So we have to change the sign. Minus Vn equals zero. Okay. Now, what about our Kirchhoff's current law? Well, we could do a little loop here for Kirchhoff's voltage law and find that V out is equal to VR2. But that we knew just by looking at it. So, Which is to say that we implicitly used KVL. We're just so smart that we did it without even recognizing that we did it. We're that good. So, okay. Uh, and then we've got KCL. Um, we could apply KCL here. But it's not really going to give us anything useful. It's going to introduce, like, what is the current coming in from the source, which is introducing a new variable that we don't know. So it's not really useful to us. Um, same with this node down here. If we applied KCL, it would be involving the current coming from the source and not, not useful, introducing a new variable again. So. Let's use this node, the middle node. The middle node tells us that, so if I was to draw on here, this would be IR1. IR1 is equal to IR2. Everything going in to that node has to equal everything going out of that node, right? Or if you sum everything going in, it equals zero. So if I said IR1 minus IR2, because IR2 is leaving the node, minus IR2 equals zero, we find that IR1 equals IR2. 
which is always true for series elements, right? A quick application of KCL tells us that elements in series always share the same current. Okay, so we've done a little bit of circuit analysis here. We've written down four equations. Um, really, uh, we've got an, a fifth equation too, right? That VR2 is equal to V out. And we're going to call these equations star, okay? I'll offer them a star. Um, and then this would be like star A. B, C, D. So we've already established that V out is equal to VR2, so we can solve for VR2 in this system of equations, star. We want to eliminate the three unknown variables, VR1, IR1, and IR2. Okay? So it is good that we have four equations, so we can eliminate those three variables. We begin with star B and proceed by substitution of the others into star. So VR2 is equal to IR2 R2. That was star B, right? This guy? So I'll, I'll check the, the B. Uh, since we're solving for VR2, we're solving for V out, which is equal to VR2. So. We'll start there. And then we're just going to substitute in stuff on the right-hand side of the equation. It doesn't always go this easily, but it, it turns out that it's a pretty easy problem, so we'll be fine. We'll just do some substitution, and things will drop out for us. So we know that VR2 is equal to IR2, R2. Do we have another equation that has IR2 in it? Yes. D, right? Star D. We just say that that's just equal to IR1, right? So equals IR1, R2. And uh, IR1, do we have another formula that has that in it? A, right? Star A. So we say IR1 is equal to VR1 divided by R1. So equals VR1. So now it's going to be times R2 over R1. Great. And uh, VR1, we have a, another equation we haven't used, C is equal to V in minus V R two, right? I'm gonna bring the R two over R one out front. V in minus V R two. Great. Now we've got V in is what we're looking for uh, uh, in terms of variables left over, right? We wanted to get to Vn. We, and Vr2 we know is just V out, so that's good. So let's, Vr2 is on both sides of the equation, so let's sum both sides by this Vr2 term on the right hand side and group them. So this implies that Vr2 times 1 plus R2 over R1 V, uh, oh, not VR2. Um, that's already factored out. So I factored out VR2 equals R2 over R1 times V in. Great. Divide both sides by 1 plus R2 over R1. And we have our solution for VR2, which is R2 over R1 divided by 1 plus R2 over R1 Vn. And I think it's a little bit nicer to write as dropping the R1 to the denominator. 
we get R2 over 1 plus, or not 1 plus, R1 plus R2 times V in. Great. So, the two resistor voltage divider then says that V out, which is just VR2, is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2 times V in. Which we chose that R2 was the output resistor arbitrarily, right? We could have chosen it to be R1. And all of the same thing would have would have uh, come down and we would have ended up with an R1 here. So what we might write is R out divided by R1 plus R2 times V in. Where R out is either R1 or R2 depending on which resistor you take the output voltage from. So that's a nice simple relationship. Um, and it effectively just divides the input voltage by some fraction of one, right? So either uh, uh, it can go down to zero. So if you have R2 much smaller than R1, this ratio approaches zero, right? If, R, if R1 is really big and R2 is small, this ratio approaches zero. And the output voltage is much smaller than the input voltage. If R2 is much larger than R1, then this ratio is close to 1, and Vn pretty much just becomes V out. Okay? So that allows us to sort of have a dial for voltage between the input voltage and 0, depending on how we choose R, R1 and R2. Also, this little, so it's useful as a technique for dividing voltage, but it's also a very useful analytic technique. So we just see this two resistor in series uh, voltage divider circuit or fragment of a circuit. And we know that we can apply this voltage divider rule to it. And it's much faster to just remember this simple, simple formula than to go through the analysis that we just did, right? It's good to be able to do it anytime you want, just to do the analysis, but you kind of uh, uh, need, need speed sometimes, need to be quick sometimes, and, and committing to memory some important things I think is good. So, so this is one of the few things I think you should commit to memory is the voltage divider rule. So it's the resistance of the resistor you're taking the output from, Divided by the sum of the other resistances, that's the fraction times the input voltage gives you the output voltage. Good. If there are n resistors in series, it can be shown that the voltage divider relationship is as follows. So it actually is pretty nice. If you have multiple of them, you take R out, so whichever resistor it is that is your output resistor, um, divided by the sum of all the other resistances, including R out, so I'll include it in here explicitly, all the way up to the nth resistor. So the fraction is always R out divided by the sum of the resistances. Okay, so that's the voltage divider circuit. It, it shows up a lot, and it also uh, generalizes to components that aren't simple resistors as well. So we'll talk about impedance in the coming weeks, and impedance is something that uh, uh, behaves this way too. Um, so that you can do a, a ratio of impedances and you have a voltage divider for other types of, of components. So it's not just for resistors.
Okay, any questions on voltage dividers? Okay.